Hi, I'm Sue. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading. I'm reading for March 28th. I hope that things are going well in your life today. Jesus is our only hope in this fallen world, friend. Whether circumstances are great or they're very difficult, most of the time there's both going on at any given time. Even at that, no matter how good it is, it's all fleeting. Good or bad, the circumstances of life are fleeting. We have to build our life on the rock of Jesus Christ. The word of God, the eternal, everlasting word. Speaking of the word, that's a great segue. Today I'm reading 1 Samuel 4 through 8 from the World English Bible. Verse 1. The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. The Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. When they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. When the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has Yahweh defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us get the Ark of Yahweh's covenant out of Shiloh and bring it to us that it may come among us and save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant, Yahweh of armies, excuse me, the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh of armies, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of Yahweh's covenant came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? They understood that Yahweh's Ark had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. They said, Woe to us, for there has not been such a thing before. Woe to us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of the mighty gods? These are the gods that struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and behave like men, O you Philistines, that you not be servants to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Strengthen yourselves like men and fight. The Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and each man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, for thirty thousand footmen of Israel fell. God's ark was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. A man of Benjamin ran out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he came, behold, Eli was sitting on the seat by the road, watching for his heart, uh, watching for his heart trembled for God's ark. When the man, see, he knew, he knew it shouldn't have been brought out there. When the men came into the city and told about it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What does the noise of this tumult mean? The man hurried and came and told Eli. Now, I'm going to stop there on that cliffhanger to share a thought. Um, all right, first of all, if you read yesterday, we know that Hophni and Phinehas were no good. They were already in trouble. Um, God had prophesied doom to Eli because Eli hadn't confronted them. So everything's all messed up. It reminds me of the verse that says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Okay, Phineas was supposed to lead the, the order, you know, the spiritual order. And they had them, everything going on uh, with the worship at Shiloh was mixed up. You know, the ceremonial uh, presentation of the offerings and all that. Hophni and Phineas had messed that up. They were doing all kinds of sh terrible, uh, immoral shenanigans. And then Eli lets him take the ark out with them to fight and really you know it was it's kind of um i'm going to go out on a limb to talk about this off the top of my head but they said that it was the the ark of the yahweh of armies well okay if if i can god is whoever we need him to be right he he's he is yahweh of armies and they needed they needed that aspect of god it he is the the God of, you know, he's Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer. He is Jehovah Nisi, our banner. He is all those various names of God. He He is those things. Um, but, and by the way, I love the, the names of God, all of them, encompassing, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, various ones, the Ancient of Days, the Lily of the Valley, on and on, right? Rose of Sharon, all the references. Um, but anyway, so they they knew that somehow, but do you see how they used it in a way that wasn't in coordination with God and his spirit? This is what some people do with the word of God. You know, when we're releasing prayer, enacting our faith, confessing the word, it has to come from that place of union with the Lord, of faith, of 
of true faith. You can't just take the word and use it like some sort of potion or witchcraft and expect it to have a positive result in your life. And that's kind of what they were doing here. They're invoking the covenant, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant and the name of God, like it was some kind of, you know, um, some kind of carnal weapon almost, or even spiritual weapon without God's approval, without him, right? It's nothing without him. It's pure witchcraft without him. It's stubbornness. The Bible says stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. You have to think about that one for a while. But anyway, that's what I see going on here. So Eli's sitting there watching and waiting, pining, because that tells me in his heart, he knew they sh he shouldn't have let it go. He knew he, he shouldn't have let the, the ark go, but somehow he let them coerce him. You know, he didn't stop them because everything's all messed up. You know, he probably was manipulated into it. You're going to cause us to lose if you don't let us take it. Something like that. You can just picture the scenario, right? They're human. They're, people weren't any different. There's still people back then. All right. So it says, um, Eli's sitting there and the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now, Eli was 98 years old. His eyes were set so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am he who came out of the army. I fled today out of the army. Now, see how it repeats itself? That grammar I keep talking about. This is why sometimes it's hard to read in a, in a flow. And I know I keep talking about that. It's just very interesting to me. So I'm going to read that sentence again. The man said to Eli, I am he who came out of the army and I fled today out of the army. He said, how did the matter go, my son? He who brought the news answered, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been also a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and God's ark has been captured. So there's like the worst possible news Eli could get that the thing he feared the most. Um, when he made mention of God's ark, Eli fell off from his seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child and near to be delivered. Now, I wonder what Phineas saw. I mean, Eli saw the second he died and saw on the other side of the veil. I wonder what presented, you know, was Jesus standing there, the pre-incarnate Christ? Was, did he go before the throne of God? Did he go to, was it Abraham's bosom? These are things that aren't talked about in church a lot. Where did he go? Did he go to, you know, was that the same as paradise? Sheol? Um, <clears throat> anyway, that's another subject for study. So it says his uh, daughter-in-law, where is it? His daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. When she heard the news that God's ark was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her pains came on her. About that time of her death, about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have given birth to a son. But she didn't answer, neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because God's ark was taken, because of her father-in-law and her husband, she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for God's ark has been taken. Now the Philistines had taken God's ark, and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines took God's ark and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. That's their big statue, um, God, God's statue. When the people of Ashdod arose early from the next day, Behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before Yahweh's ark. You betcha. <laughs> Every knee shall bow. They took Dagon, set him in his place again. When they arose early on the following morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before Yahweh's ark and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was intact. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any of those who came into Dagon's house step on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. But Yahweh's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and struck them with tumors, even Ashdod and its borders. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not stay with us, for his hand is severe on us and on Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of God of Israel be carried over to Gath. They carried the ark of God of Israel there. It was so that after they had carried it there, Yahweh's hand was against that city with a very great confusion. And he struck the men 
of the city both small and great so that tumors broke out on them so they sent god's ark to ekron as god's ark came to ekron the ekronites cried out saying they have brought about this ark of god of israel to us to kill us and our people so it's like a hot potato they're passing around isn't it they sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the philistines and they said send the ark of god of israel away let it go again to its own place that it not kill us and our people for there was a deadly confusion throughout all the city the hand of god was very heavy there the men who didn't die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven it's interesting it says the hand of God was very heavy there. Now, originally, I would have interpreted that. And you have to look it up and study it out, okay? This is off the top of my head. It used to be I just figured it meant he was against them, you know, causing confusion, tumors, whatever. But these days, I wonder about it being a little different. For one thing, if the presence of God was there, it's possible they felt that, that glory, that radiating glory. And it's also true that devils manifest kinds of things happen in the presence of God because demons can't be comfortable there. So it's interesting, you know, to think that some of that sickness and manifestation was probably demonic activity. So you just wonder when it says the hand of God was heavy, very heavy there. It's, it's so it's, you know, when the priest went into the, um, to the Holy of Holies, he had to go through certain rituals and be cleaned or he would die in the, in that presence of God. Right. So you have, it's like a two-edged sword there. You have this, this radiating glory, life-giving glory. But it also cleanses evil. So there's just some thoughts about, about this, this Ark of the Covenant. Chapter 6, verse 1. Yahweh's Ark was in the country of the Philistines seven months. The Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with Yahweh's Ark? Show us how we should send it to its place. They said, if you send the ark of God of Israel, don't send it empty, but by all means return a trespass offering to him. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, what should, what should the trespass offering be, which we shall return to him? They said, five gold tumors and five golden mice for the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory to God of Israel. Perhaps he will release his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. Now, that's strange. I don't know that God was asking for that. But do you notice that they're giving back an offering in the kind that they want? In the, you know, they want the tumors dealt with. They want the mice dealt with. And so... They're acknowledging that in their gift. Now, if that means anything or not, I don't know, but that's sort of a pattern. Um, so they're giving, you know, what they want to receive, connected to what they want to receive. Um, perhaps he will release his hand from you and your gods and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened his heart when he had worked wonderfully among them? Didn't they let the people go and they departed? Now, therefore, take and prepare yourselves a new cart and two milk cows, on which there has come no yoke, and tie the cows to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take Yahweh's ark, and lay it on the cart, put the jewels of gold, which you return to him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by its side, and send it away, that it may go. Behold, if it goes by the way of its own border to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It was a ch uh, chance that happened to us. The men did so and took two milk cows and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. They put Yahweh's ark on the cart and coffer, and the coffer with the golden mice and the images of the tumors. The cows took the straight way by the way to Beth Shemesh. They went along the highway, lowing as they went, and didn't turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there, and there was a great stone. Then they split the wood of the cart and offered up the cows for a burnt offering to Yahweh. The Levites looked down, or took down Yahweh's ark and the coffer that was with it, in which the jewels of gold were, put them on the great stone, and the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifice offerings the same day to Yahweh. When the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors 
which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering to Yahweh, for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, and for Ekron one, and the golden mice according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fortified cities and of country villages, even to the great stone on which they set down Yahweh's ark. That stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. He struck of the men of Beth Shemesh. I wonder if it's still there buried. Um, anyway, he struck of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked at Yahweh's ark. He struck 50,000, 70 of the men. Then the people mourned because Yahweh had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before Yahweh, this holy God? I'm sure they never expected to come walking back with cows pulling it. I mean, only God, only God does that kind of thing. So it says, um, 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 who is able to stand before Yahweh, this holy God? To whom shall he go up from us? They sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerim, Jer, uh, Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back Yahweh's ark. Come down and bring it up to yourselves. The men of Kiriath Jerim, uh, wow. the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took Yahweh's ark and brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep Yahweh's ark. From that day, the ark stayed in Kiriath Jerim. The time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after Yahweh. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you are returning to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you, and direct your hearts to Yahweh, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtoreth, and served Yahweh only. Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mitzvah, and I will pray to Yahweh for you. They gathered together to Mitzvah, and drew water, and poured it out before Yahweh, and fasted on that day, and said there, we have sinned against Yahweh. Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mitzvah. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together at Mitzvah, the Lord, lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Don't stop crying to Yahweh our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to Yahweh. Samuel cried to Yahweh for Israel, and Yahweh answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines came near to battle against Israel. But Yahweh thundered with a great thunder on that day on the Philistines and confused them, and they were struck down before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them until they came under beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzvah and Shun and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Yahweh helped us until now. So the Philistines were subdued, and they stopped coming within the border of Israel. Yahweh's hand was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The, the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath, and Israel recovered its border out of the hand of the Philistines. There was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year in a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzvah, and he judged Israel in all those places. His return was to Ramah, for his house was there, and he judged Israel there, and he built an altar to Yahweh there. One more chapter. I don't know why this one is longer, except this last chapter is pretty short. Chapter 8. When Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. His sons didn't walk in the in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel in Ramah. They said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge over us like the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge. Samuel prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they tell you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me as a king over them. According to all the works of which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they also do to you. Now, therefore, listen to their voice. However, you shall protest solemnly to them and show, shall show them the way of the king who will reign over them. Samuel told all the words to the people who asked him for a king. 
He said, this will be the way of the king who shall rule over you, and he will take your sons and appoint them as his servants for his chariots and for his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint them to him for captains of thousands and captains of fifties. He will assign some to plow the ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and the instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be performers, to be cooks, and to be bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves, even their best, and give them to his servants. He will take one-tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to your officers and his servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your best young men, and your donkeys and assign them to his own work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you will be his servant. You will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and Yahweh will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel heard all the works, words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of Yahweh. Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and make them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, Everyone go to your own city. That's it for today. Kind of leaves us hanging. We're going to see what happens when they begin to find this new king, find and appoint him. So stay tuned. God bless you. Till next time.